Welcome to today's uh, session, Bereavement, the Family Stress Test, which is part of the Good Grief Mini Festival on the theme of how grief affects family relationships. The death of a loved one often puts family relationships under enormous pressure. Not only are family members coping with a range of personal emotions, they're often physically exhausted and doing their best to honour the wishes of the person who has died. For some family members, that may be complicated feelings about the person who died or judgment about the way that they live their lives. Family bonds may already be ruptured or dysfunctional, something which a bereavement will often highlight or amplify. So this panel today is going to examine the ways uh, in which a bereavement can put pressure on families and chosen families. We look at some of the social issues and tensions that can arise after a death, uh, the grief hierarchies that form, and the many ways in which families can fracture as well as come together in new formations during this tender time. Um, I'm Dr. Andrew Blades and I'm really happy to be facilitating this panel today. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of English at the University of Bristol and my own research has been concerned with many sides of grief over the years from the collective trauma of the AIDS epidemic to my more recent and current preoccupation with hoarding. Uh, we're also honoured to have two great panellists um, here today. Lottie Randomly is a funeral celebrant, educator, activist and mentor whose work fo focuses on supporting others to navigate change, endings and transitions, including death and grief. They've worked in the voluntary sector mental health services for 16 years, uh, managing projects and leading teams that cast a social justice centred lens on the fields of health and well-being. Lottie is an advisory board member at uh, digital well-being hub Voxel Hub and founded the Resilience Lab during their time at OTR Bristol. Dr Kate Woodthorpe is a reader in sociology at the University of Bath and director of the Centre of Death and Society, the UK's only research centre devoted to the social aspects of death, dying and bereavement. She specialises in the social aspects of death uh, dying and bereavement, and her research has delved into topics such as funeral poverty and practice, families and familial obligation, professional development for staff in the death care industry, and bereavement benefits. She's published extensively on issues related to the end of life, has advised both UK and Scottish governments, and was uh, editor of the academic journal Mortality until 2019. And last of all, we'd like to give a warm welcome to all of you joining us uh, from wherever you are attending this event today. We hope you're well and that you enjoy it. Um, we'll start by discussing some of the family issues that arise in times of bereavement as a panel, sharing some of our expertise and experience, and then um, we'll address some of the things that uh, come up from you. So um, to start with, um, I thought it would be uh, nice for us to reflect on some of our own personal experiences um, in this area. Some of the family issues and tensions that arise after a loved one's um, death. Um, from my perspective, this is really um, uh, an issue that arose in 2008, 2008 after my mother died. Um, I'm an only child and so I uh, had to support my father through his grief as well as um, manage my own and I in a sense became a kind of um, ad hoc and unofficial grief counsellor to my father but I didn't really have a space in the family for me to talk about my own grief and so that's that's kind of where my connection comes in a sense through all of those years of trying to navigate two griefs that have very different um, stages to them and, had, and were of a very different nature and kind, whilst also trying to, to maintain compassion for my father who was going through really complex grief. And I wonder if um, our other panellists have, have some experiences perhaps like that or, or that connect to that, that um, uh, make them think about um, this, this question of family uh, tension and the ways in which relationships can be strained or changed um, when we're bereaved. Who first? So, yes, Kate, yeah, would, would you like to uh, share with us? Oh, okay, well, hello everyone, good morning. Um, like Andrew said, I'm Dr. Kate Woodthorpe. I'm one of the directors of the Centre for Death and Society at the University of Bath. I'm a sociologist by background and have been working in this area for almost 20 years, which I, I quite can't believe really. Um, 
two things come to mind straight away before I um, share my own experience and how I have become particularly interested in families at the end of life. But one is that, uh, and Walter's has written about this, about grief hierarchies. So I think we must come back to that later if that's um, of interest. And another one, Andrew, is just to, to note also, I think the loved one is a really problematic term sometimes because it assumes that everyone mm -hmm. is loved and all relationships are positive. And actually what we've found in our own research is you know, sometimes people can feel very ambivalent when someone's died, even relieved. Or um, And I'd really like to return to that if that's possible later, because I think that's really important to recognise the complexity of human relationships and then how that gets reflected at the end of life when someone dies and afterwards. My, my own experience, uh, I've been working, like I said, I've been working in this for 20 years, partly instigated, not by family, but I was... Um, made aware of the fragility of life as a teenager. I've written about this before, I've included it in, like I can, I've talked about it before in academic work. But when I had, I four friends of mine were killed in a car crash uh, when we were 17, 18. And uh, it, it, you know, life changing, it uh, realized how uh, you can be here one minute and gone the next, but also how, how much there was a performance, performative element of grief and people were judging each other on how they behaved very much um, in, in our friendship groups. That's beyond family, but it's still very powerful, all these, these judgments that are going on. But my own experience more recently was when my father-in-law died uh, unexpectedly about five years ago. And my mother-in-law had already died 20 years ago. So my husband doesn't have any parents now, uh, but his father had remarried and we, we, his father was the linchpin between these, between um, two families, uh, his, uh, his original family with his children, who I, I married one of them, and then his second wife and her children. And we had to work out who we were in relation to each other when this central figure had died. And as an academic, I looked for literature on this. I looked in, in, I wanted to understand it. What's been written about this? How do we, how do we make sense of it? And there was nothing. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that there was nothing really that resonated with me about the, the relational components of death and the fact that it was a huge relational experience and it was all in relation to other people. And I think because I was a, an in-law, a daughter-in-law, I was on the I was one step removed so I could observe what was going on and I was part of it. But it was a very uh, you know, powerful moment of realization of, gosh, in academia, we've got to do better. To and I suppose as a sociologist, to recognize the social side of uh, the end of life, rather than just the psychology of grief, it is a profoundly social experience. So that's what I've been championing for the last, well, five, six years since that happened. So that's my own entry into this area. Thanks, Kate. Yes, because that social side continues and can continue for years and years and years. It can fundamentally alter the way that we see ourselves um, in family or chosen family networks and relationships. And we have to deal with those consequences for as long as we deal with grief and as, for as long as we're grieving and beyond. So that's a really, really profound shift, isn't it? Um, I, was say, I wouldn't say we're grieving now necessarily. But we still have those relationships and they're still being maintained and we're still they're evolving now without father-in-law so you know it's beyond just the active grieving phase it is it's about the um the relationships as they unfold over time yeah thanks so much kate yeah absolutely Lo lots and lots of things to think there about about the organic evolution of those relationships and our relationships to ourselves as well because our sense of, of who we are is relational. So it, it, it changes our, can fundamentally change our sense of ourselves in those family networks or chosen family relationships. Lottie, would you like to share um, your thoughts on this? On this yeah, issue definitely. Um, hello. And yes, just wanted to say so grateful to be here. And hello, everyone. Um, I ought to just say that I'm a fairly new celebrant. I've only been doing it for about a year and I trained a couple of years ago. But, um, you know, I can certainly and I know that there'll be other celebrants with a lot more experience, but I, you know, I can speak from this year that I've had as a celebrant and also my personal experience. Um, 
you know, with, with my own family, et cetera. But um, Kate, I also just want to really pick up on what you were saying about loved ones. I'm so glad to hear you mention that because in my notes that like, earlier this week that was one of the one of the things that I wanted to raise as well like I generally shy away from using the term loved one in when I'm meeting with families because I don't want to make that assumption like people often have much more complex relationships um you know so we just yeah can't make that assumption um but yeah so my own personal experience that I wanted to kind of talk about here is that um so about six years ago, my brother Al died. He killed himself. And um, at that point in time, he was under the care of a mental health trust. Um, and he actually made it quite clear to that trust that of what his intentions were. And they didn't respond to him and pick up his, yeah, pick up his request for help. So obviously that was you know just absolutely awful um for our family um there was a big there was an inquiry um which happened much later on in the you know months and months later and although we were able to kind of pull together as a family during the funeral um the Al's death brought up a lot of kind of unprocessed difficult stuff from the past that just really fractured us for a very long time um thankfully we're not fractured and we're not so fractured anymore but it was really really intense um and eight just less than 18 months later my maternal grandfather died and I think through a kind of combination of wanting to be the protective patriarch of the family and also probably a little bit of avoidance um he didn't tell us how unwell he was until it was too late and so um he got ill you know he was we finally learned that he was kind of really really unwell in mid-december and he died on the solstice that year and we didn't get to say goodbye to him. Um, and I often think about what, how different that bereavement and that all of that stuff for our family would have been had we not been still absolutely churned up by, um, by Al's death. And yeah, it makes me think a lot about, it's given me lots of cause to reflect on just when people have multiple bereavements and how do you, you know, as a family separate those all out and you, you, you know, it's impossible. You can't, um, you just get absolutely thrown into the mix and churned with it all. Um, yeah. So that's kind of, that's where I'm, that's partly where I'm coming from. And un perhaps unsurprisingly, I think this happens for a lot of people who end up going into the funeral sector and particularly celebrants, um, it was the experience of those two very different funerals um, that was really pivotal in me becoming a celebrant in the first place. Thanks so much for, for sharing, Lottie, and also um, uh, for you sharing your experience as well, Kate. Um, I suppose that that brings us into this, um, the issue of funerals, really, and that they become a kind of focal point for a lot of that stress and strain and there were ways of solemnizing that and and mm -hmm. doing things in to particular structures but how, how do we think that funerals can become a focal point for those emotional family tensions or maybe they um, spark economic tensions maybe grief hierarchies um, are established or or kind of um or kind of grow um through the the process of organizing funerals um, uh, what kinds of um, issues are most um, are often most pressing or, or visible uh, for families in, at, at that time? Shall I? Um, maybe I should pick pick Thanks this up. But I suspect that Kate will have some stuff to say on the economic on the economic stuff because I know the centre's done some research into uh, funeral poverty. But um, I mean, gosh, there's so there's like so much we could say about this. I mean, let's just not forget this is. As, as you as you said in your introduction Andrew like this is a super super tender time for families um that you know however the death occurred they're dealing with a myriad of different emotions 
feeling probably very, very overwhelmed. Um, they're probably absolutely exhausted. And, you know, of the families that I've worked with, they're often really out of their comfort zones. You know, they've perhaps never arranged a funeral before. So they're having to deal with all of this stuff that's completely new. They've got all of that going on. And then families are often really thrown together at this times, in these times. So they might, you know, they might be from different parts of the country and then they've all got to come together to kind of, you know, meet the celebrant, meet the funeral director. Um, and what I notice is that often any existing conflicts or fractures, they just get foregrounded, right? They just come, they, they get really amplified. Um, and then, so on top of that, so if, if the family has then um, knows what they want from the funeral and they've spoken to their person about it, then it's, then it's not so difficult to kind of start crafting the funeral and co-producing it together. But if you're in a set of circumstances where the family have absolutely no idea what their person wanted, then, then there's the possibility that conflicts arise because people think that that, that, that person might have wanted different things. Um, and I think it's part of the job of being a celebrant is to kind of be really sensitive to that stuff and um, make space for it. Um, and I think, you know, I feel like celebrants aren't particularly good at talking about the fact that actually a big part of our role is, um, is com you know, is, com is having to be a mediator and doing some conflict resolution and, um, yeah, it's not just about standing at the front and, and reading <laughs> reading the ceremony, you know, the ceremony script. There's a there's a lot more to it. Yeah, thanks, Lottie. Yeah, that there's a kind of almost a counselling role, sort of in loco counsellor um, role. Yeah, yeah mediation. Um, certainly, my experiences with my both of my parents' funerals were very positive. With the celebrant who spent a lot, devoted a lot of time to getting our stories, so that they could then um, accurately um, reflect our um, wishes but it for me as an only child in some ways that takes it, it, it's an enormous pressure but it also take took some pressure off because I didn't have siblings to um to to, to, to deal with you know conflicting emotions or conflicting priorities um, so in a sense I had my version of my father and my mother and that was the version that that became the official version the official narrative um, and at my father's funeral, my my husband um, also spoke. So we kind of our own household, our own family um, that we've created became the kind of center of of, of our um, uh, memorial for my father. But those experiences are not they're not always common or, or, mm. or you know, there, there are many, many experiences that don't follow that kind of pattern. Kate, do you have thoughts um, about how funerals become this kind of focal point for some of these tensions? Oh, many, many. Um, I think, uh, I don't even know where to begin, but one of the things I would really like to see, and I think it's going to happen in this country, is much more a much more creative approach to um, memorialising and commemorating and bringing people together. And I say that because I, as a sociologist, I see this, that we are moving from a very... Um, producer-led model of provision to consumer-led and consumers I think the next generation Andrew York probably before your time but the next generation of baby boomers coming through to organize their parents funerals are going to be much more savvy much more uh, clear about what their expectations are and that will include not having a funeral at all uh, potentially or doing something with the ashes we just fit we just had a, uh, a study um, that came to a conclusion pre-pandemic and that was for people who hadn't had a funeral at the time of the disposal. It was decoupling the bodies, it was saying goodbye to the body, to, from actually commemorating the person. And for everyone who did that, it's called a direct cremation. But for everyone who did that, they all did something afterwards. It's just that it was more, it was maybe invite only. It was later on so that more people could be there even. Uh, because people, it took, it, not everyone can take time off or, or get out of commitments at very short notice. But I would also like to see a much greater um, appreciation and of, of, uh, of other belief systems. So for example, other belief systems, I say this as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, a wasp. And I look for the Jewish faith and I think, wow, that is the way to do it. Uh, that it's, if it's to 
very quickly dispose of the body and manage that, but then have a series of rituals over a period of time. So people keep coming back into the into them, the people who are most significantly affected after someone's died, that people keep coming back into their lives remember and to not acknowledge them and to acknowledge their grief and their loss to talk about the person who's died to talk about death um rather than all this emphasis on a funeral that's mm. three three weeks four weeks after someone's died and then the gulf nothing you know it's it's i would love to see much more creative sort of it's, it's me that feels like it breathes life into ironically life but life into the process of commemoration um, and being creative and, and sort of taking that time pressure off things. There are some things that have to be done. The body has to be disposed of. That has to happen. It's a public health issue. But there's such an imperative, you know, of, oh, you've got to make these very big decisions. And like a lot of said, it can amplify tensions that are already there. But actually to take a big deep breath and give yourself a bit of space around it, to think of what's the most appropriate thing, what's the, what would be the most comforting thing, I think would be wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Kate. I, I think this is something that's become more common recently um, since the pandemic. Uh, I know many people and I can see in the chat too that people are sharing their experiences of this, that where it wasn't possible to have a fu the funeral that one might have imagined or planned, um, but the funeral still had to go ahead, that people have worked creatively to think about how memorialization in different forms might happen further down the line. And I know of a number of people who've had that experience um, with my father. He, he d d died during the, the pandemic, so January 2021, but of Parkinson's disease. And we had a, a very small um, funeral. You know, we could only have, I think it was, was it 12 people? Um, but many, many people joined online and that changed in some cases, the dynamic, because we knew that when we were giving eulogies, we were we were doing this. In in fact, in in, in a way, we were we were speaking to an, to people who wouldn't have been able to make the funeral in person, even if um, you know, even if there were up to a hundred people could have been um, included. So it uh, this has kind of evolved in 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 all of these different directions, hasn't it? In recent in recent years, yeah. Um, Speaking of that, really, I, I wonder also what kinds of ways um, funerals or opportunities funerals um, give to to kind of in, reintegrate um, family members um, uh, or to kind of um, forge forge new connections. Is that something that um, that you have experience of too um, in in both of your in your research and your roles? Shall I? Last bit, I, I could go for well, it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay, sorry. Go for it. That also came out in the study that uh, we did on cremation choices and funeral choices. Uh, it's we've published in, on it several times, and I'm very happy to share the papers um, with people if they would like to see them uh, either now or I'll put the link in the chat in a moment or afterwards. Um, one of the big pro one of the big challenges is for, for example, the people that choose not to have a funeral uh, in our study. Oh, and they did something separately or invite only that you can't do a control test for it you can't sort of test what been what will be missed in the long term and we had when we published a paper on that and someone wrote a response which was really it was very fair it was say actually a funeral or some kind of ritual after someone has died there are so few opportunities now to connect up people's lives together because we're very atomized in the uk and most lots of countries are very atomized um, behind closed doors. There aren't very opp many opportunities when someone dies to bring their, their, their friends, their extended family, their colleagues, you know, to come back together to talk about this person and to talk about memories, uh, you know, beyond just the person who's died, but actually to reconnect. And that if that's lost, what will be lost long term that, you know, colleagues, for example, reconnecting, they would never normally, their paths wouldn't have crossed, they've come together to, to attend a funeral, and then they find, oh, we've got loads of shared interests, why haven't we kept this relationship going, mm. and start talking again, you can't test for that, what's lost and what isn't, so I do think when people think about not having something in person, or having it very invite only, I can totally understand, it's because, one of the reasons is because 
the performative element is utterly draining, can be utterly draining. Um, and also there's an element of if you, there was difficult relationships with the person who's died, it can be very difficult to be honest about that if you are having to do this performance. So I get that, I get why you know, controlling uh, a, a ritual is, can be really important. On the other hand, there is the risk of what might be lost from that. And that is about connections. And like you say, reinvigoration, about reconnection. In and, and also I have to say, although this is brilliant, you know, doing things online, there is something about in-personness that, that you can't recreate online. So there is these are, these are choices that people need to make at the time. And, and as I'm sure will be a key message from today, it's always worth talking to people before the end, even if you're in great health, just about what you'd want to happen because you know the afterwards there is this time imperative and like Lottie said it can throw people into chaos especially you know and it can be a completely overwhelming decisions can be made that you might regret uh, later down the line so it's really worth having these conversations even if it's just a very light touch one before yeah, absolutely thanks Kate and I think sometimes those conversations might be there might be tensions or difficulties because of particular there, there are also issues issues around the, uh, the identity of the person who has died. So um, one issue that might come up is the specific difficulties that arise when the person who died was queer or had a gender identity that wasn't acknowledged or recognised by other family members, perhaps. And how, how does that then, how does a funeral reflect that and honour and respect that? Um, I wonder if, if we have thoughts on that too. Um, I mean, I've certainly got some thoughts on that I've got thoughts on all of it Kate you've just raised so many things that I think are really fascinating and just remind me that I just wish there were more models and we, were, we could just start reimagining funerals and memorials more and you know certainly I you know in all honesty I do feel sometimes like the half an hour slot at the creme like you can do a lot with it and I maintain that you can but also you are very limited to how much you can fit in and how many multiple narratives and stories you can weave into a half an hour slot. But um, yeah, to, thinking about, um, you know, something that I've been particularly interested in is thinking about the rights of queer and trans folk to get their stories heard within their, you know, funerals for them. And, um, um, you know, worst case scenarios, families of origin who are arranging funerals might not feel comfortable about person, you know, part of their person's sexuality or uh, gender identity and won't mention that in the funeral. They'll ignore it, they'll gloss over it. And that can be just absolutely devastating for um, the chosen family and friends who also come to that ceremony. Um, um, I, you know, I've worked with um, a couple of families of um, queer folks. I've done funerals for them, and luckily, I've 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 had opportunities to be able to weave multiple narratives together. But I'm thinking about a funeral in particular that was for someone in their late forties who um, died in an accident, and um, their family of origin used different pronouns for them than their chosen family. And we had to have some really frank conversations. Luckily, I had access to both groups, but we had to have some really frank conversations about um, what pronouns we were going to use for that person and respecting their... I mean, they hadn't left any wishes for their funeral. So, you know, we had to kind of make it up as we go along. But, um, you know, in a lot of cases, that, that doesn't... That still doesn't happen. People's bits of people's identity get totally lost. Um, and um, I'd really like to see celebrants undertake as funeral directors kind of um ah oh, what's the word just like showing that they have a bit more literacy in this kind of stuff um I think I'd also just like to there's a so there's a really cool resource called making choices when planning a funeral guide for queer people which is by um a guy called Ash Hayhurst I think we'll get we'll I'm not able to put it in chat but I think we'll put it in the chat at the end um, yeah, really great resource for that kind of stuff. Thanks, Lottie. It's so it's so good to hear about these resources existing because I think um, so many of us, when we're bereaved, 
there are a whole range of documents that just immediately are on our desks from probate documents if, if you're sorting out as next of kin or you have power of attorney to um, all of the, the, the kinds of things that we have, all of the kind of administration around the estate and closing of accounts and things. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the funeral aspect is kind of, it's, it's the thing that that's, it is most pressing because it's happening um you know in the in the short term but sometimes we don't have the energy really to be able to to kind of plan effectively and take take as much time as we'd like because of all of these other responsibilities so having these resources is really incredibly um important um i think we might move um on to some questions now um from the audience we do have um a few um coming in um and there's a question from from tara hello tara um welcome to our session um, Tara asks, do you think that um, those of us in the UK can learn from the American use of funeral homes um, with their meet and greet coming and going ceremonies, etc., with space between each so that mourners can attend all or some of the day, rather than that half an hour in a crematorium chapel idea that seems more, more kind of prevalent in, in this society? Um, do, yeah, do Kate or Lottie, do either of you have thoughts about that idea? Lottie, do you want to go first? Yeah, who, should, who, who wants to start? I mean, I'm not very familiar, I'm not hugely familiar with this model, but I mean, absolutely, like I can, I think having a bit more spaciousness to be able to hang out, talk to one another, meet one another um, is, you know, it's just so much more kind of relaxed way of way of doing things um because it can feel incredibly intense just that you know that short that short ceremony although you know let's not forget that people often do have events afterwards you know like a wake or some kind of family gathering afterwards I'm not sure if that's entirely answered the question but that's my kind of I'd be interested to hear what Kate thinks uh, well years ago I edited a book that had a chapter on it from Sheila Harper and she did a study on comparing UK and US funeral homes and practices and she looked at also the visibility of the body uh, within mm -hmm. that and how in the because the US has has more of a culture of viewing and you know publicizing a viewing and people going into a funeral home and viewing uh, compared to the UK um, as a more collective experience. Um, I think it's different also, but it's to do with the way that the, the, the it's to do with geography and the you know, space in terms of how many, where there's, in the US you're looking at much bigger space geographically, but in the UK how it's been set up over time. So local authorities typically own the crematoria cemeteries. There are some private ones, but it's mainly them. Um, but almost all funeral services are privately owned and commercial you know have commercial imperatives they are businesses they have to um, be sustainable you've got a mixed economy in the uk and that changes um how people access the services their expectations of them even potentially and the relationship between them as providers so funeral directors see walter's written about this funeral directors are very powerful in this country they are the gatekeepers mm. uh, for the vast majority of people they'll, they'll be the first people that they will be called after someone has died mm. that's what i mean perhaps that's what i mean about it being has been producer led as in funeral directors i yeah. think we're going to be much more in the next 20 years it'll be much more consumer and uh, and it'll be actually you know, is this the right thing for us not sure it is, um, less deferential to authority, more willing to challenge um, and, and do what feels right for the person who's died or for the family uh, uh, or the people who were left. And I, I totally hear Lottie, I think there's a lot about disenfranchised grief as well. And, and I know, I'm sure these festivals covered that before, but about whose grief is allowed, who's allowed to um, share their, you know, their loss and, uh, Another student did a fantastic study at, at Bath at the Centre for Death and Society called Tara Bailey, and she, she looked at people's expectations when they attended funerals. Mm. And there was so much there and about the, you know, the attendance and who was sitting where and, and who was allowed to be there, who was allowed to say something, who was contributing, who was consulted, who wasn't, who slipped in at the back because they couldn't be, they didn't want to be seen. Because, uh, or, and, and that, and, and also on the streaming front, oh my gosh, I don't see anything talked about when we're talking about screaming of funerals, any of that being thought about of actually, do people want to be seen? There is an element of actually 
lot of tension potentially in a, in a congregation that needs to be managed carefully. So there's an awful lot going on that that this in my world as an academic that is absolutely needs to be explored more fully. Thanks Kate that was just reminding me of somebody I know whose mother stipulated that she didn't want a funeral but the the funeral director um, let this person know that the coffin would be going past their house at a particular time so that they could at least um, see it going past and pay respects um, of, of a sort, but it, 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 it caused all kinds of, you know, emotional um, ramifications. Um, we, we have a question from, from Charlotte, hello Charlotte, um, which is, do you know of any advice for people with bipolar or any mental health illness um, on how to cope better with the death of someone very close to them? Um, so um, their aunt, um, age 56, recently died and her husband was bipolar type one and is struggling a lot and his relationship with his adult children is fractured um, due to this. Um, so yes, do, do, do we have any thoughts on that? Lottie, um, have, you, have you come across this situation um, before in, in your work? I mean, I not anything as specific um, and I don't know if I'd be able to speak very accurately to um, a bipolar diagnosis, but I think Gosh, I mean, it is just really, I think, you know, someone with any mental health condition is it off, off symptoms often flare up in, in grief. Like it's, I, I think it's kind of, kind of par for the course really. Um, and I would just really invite Charlotte to, um, yeah, to just check in, make sure that you've got good, you've got good support around you. Um, you know, because if you're looking after someone who's re who's really struggling, that has a huge impact on you as well. Um, and you know, and then I would also just make you know remind make, make a reminder about the usual you know the usual support networks, therapy. Um, obviously, if this person's having a really tough time, have they been to their GP recently? Um, to you know, to just flag this up. Um, but yeah, I hear, oh gosh, yeah, that's a really tough, really tough circumstances. I, um, I similarly, I don't think I'm necessarily best placed to answer that, but I do wonder if it's worthwhile asking that question again at the sessions this afternoon, because I think they are going to be more about psychological, mental health, about support that's available. So um, it might be worth, if you're able to, Charlotte, to attend um, there one of those or watch them afterwards that might be a good place to start yeah thanks Kate thanks Lottie um we have a question from Selena um about our thoughts on the different grief that different family members feel um so Selena says uh, their son age 30 died last spring and he has a brother how might the brother's grief be different from ours as parents etc can I, well, can I, can I just start by saying, so in my world, in sociology, there is a, there was a brilliant sociologist called David Morgan, and he wrote about, he created theories about how family is done, and family, he argued, is a verb, it's something that's done, it's not something you are, it's something that you do, you practice, you, and it's through everyday little rituals and little things that you do, and he came up with this idea that every, within a, within a family um, network, and family of choice, there are these family moralities and these are expectations and and this expectation of neutrality and how much you support one another and dependency um, and obligation and I think that's a good way to start thinking about how grief is different for different people because it's not just about their identity as father or brother or school mother, it's also about the expectations that accompany those roles. So as a parent, you have very different expect there are very different expectations about your um, obligations to your offspring, your children, because you brought them into this world. As a, as a sibling, it's very different because you didn't ask to be born. You, you, know, you, you, you have different obligations and expectations to the person who's died and also to the other people within that network family network and and then it's how are those enacted um that, 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 that sort of tells other people about 
what their expectations are and of each other. So I would say that's the grounding. And yes, parental grief is going to be very, very different to sibling because of those expectations for, for parents. Um, as a parent myself, I, I would expect it would also be things like you couldn't protect them. You, you, it's out of time, it's out of sequence. You should have gone first, guilt. I, 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 don't, I can't read into your situation of what you might be feeling, but that will be very different to the sibling of, of which their, the loss of their sibling is more of a peer in, in terms of age, generation, life experience, it'll be very different. Thanks, Kate. Um, Lottie, what, what's your perspective on this? Um... Yeah, I'm not, I'm just, no, I was just sitting listening to Kate and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I feel like, yeah, I feel like, what do I want to say about this? Um, I think it's really, it's really interesting to separate, you know, and to kind of think and think out like the parental grief, the sibling grief, and just really separate them out. And, it, but I'm just reminded that like when you're a family and you're all kind of thrown together, you just don't think like that, do you? You just don't like so many people don't have the the literacy, the grief literacy, because we just don't talk about this stuff very, you know, very much in everyday life. Um, and yeah, when I meet families, they're just they're just so in the churn, so in the mix of it all. Um, it's um, yeah, I'm not saying anything particularly like um, you know. Uh, yeah, nothing complete, you know, wow, but just, I just think it's, um, it's incredibly hard for families because we just don't have this literacy about these different models of grief and uh, ways to talk about this stuff yet. Yeah, it strikes me, I'm thinking about my mother's um, death, she, she died at 64 and my grandmother was still alive and she was uh, 97 by that point. And so she was at my mother's funeral and really didn't, she couldn't speak. I mean, she was um, uh, still quite a, uh, an engaged person um, at that time in her life. But it was, the, again, what, what you were saying, Kate, about this, this, you expect a certain sequence perhaps, and that sequence had been disrupted in, the, in that she'd seen at 97, she'd seen her, her daughter die. Mm -hmm. And then my uncle, my mother's brother, so my grandmother died the following year after my mother and then and then her son my mother's brother died the year after that so they went in sequence but in a different sort of sequence there and at that point the the churn that you described Lottie was so our family had just gone through one after the other mm. that the eulogies started to get mixed in some ways because then you're talking about how somebody reacted to the grief of the person who um, died the previous year. And it was really, it was, it's such a blur that time. And um, uh, because of, uh, because everything was, seemed to be happening at the same time, almost, or the griefs were overlapping in such a way mm -hmm. that it was difficult for the fam for as a family to sort of separate them out. Um, we also have a question from uh, Sylvia, who's curious about the point that was made about people who are not not grieving or don't feel the need to grieve. Um, so Sylvia is a bereavement counsellor and wonders what your thoughts are about supporting those individuals in the light of social or family expectations in various cultures here in the UK. So that's a, a question about the expectations of grieving in a particular way or feeling a need to grieve. Um, Kate, do you do you have? A um, well, I, I think there is a very big just because someone isn't doing it openly doesn't mean that they're not. I mean, that's one a, a person who's asked that question will know that more than anyone if, if you're a bereavement counsellor. That that there is some people are going to be much more open and able to articulate how they're feeling or to or visibly show it others not too much and I can even draw on my own experience with my husband when he lost his dad he didn't have the language he didn't have the words to be able to do to talk about it because he'd already lost his mum 20 years earlier you know this was this was a loss of both parents before he was 40 it's and that's massive that is absolutely massive um he needed quiet time and he renovated our garage actually in a four-week window he needed to just really focus on something you know constructive you know construction almost literally building shelves and it was just very methodical he didn't need to talk but he wasn't because he wasn't grieving he was deeply deeply 
uh, affected, but he he wasn't going to talk about it. And that's one of the things I do worry a bit about the desk cafes and talk, 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 even though I've said it myself. <laughs> um, you know, the importance of talking. That is a very middle class sometimes expectation or that people can, or ha can do that freely. For some people, it's just not a go at. It's just never going to be something that they are comfortable with or it's even an option. And I think that's really important when I've done work on funeral poverty and we've got just to do a quick plug for EDAS, we've got a talk on Monday as part of Grief Awareness Week on um, poverty and the end of life. But the, the, some people, um, particularly people who have very little money, who are living in a, who, but who don't qualify for benefits, but so very hand to mouth existence. This idea of talking and talking about death and coming to terms with it and having to fight about it, it's just not, it's not even, an, not even there it's not even an option and we found that when we were talking to people who in terms of funeral poverty who the lens through which they saw the world was a very different lens and I think in in my world in academia and we need to recognize that much much more and when we're doing research on it and talk and doing evidence building to build cases up about how people respond after a death We've got to be much more inclusive and and uh, and diverse and reflect the economic difference, ethnic difference, gender difference, uh, sexuality, age, generation, and all of this mm. is so 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 diverse across the population. Thanks, Kate. L Lottie, do you do you also have some? Yeah, I mean, I just I just couldn't you? agree couldn't agree more with what Kate was saying. And the thing that came up for me is like, do you even have the like? Some people don't even have the time to grieve like you know if you're if you've got a, a job where you don't get particularly you know the compassionate leave policy is non-existent and you go straight back into work like i think you know people you know that sort of stuff often gets forgotten about um and yeah this idea about a right way to grieve and being vocal and talk and you know well, let's talk about it and and the middle classness of that i think yeah, I think it's really important to put that on the table and not make assumptions about the best way. Um, yeah, the best way to best way to do do grief. It also remind it also reminds me that when um, when my brother died, um, my my partner um, I used, I got I got very frustrated with him at points because I felt like he wasn't grieving in the way that I expected and I wanted him to. Um, and one of, I think, something that you said, Kate, reminded me that um, my partner built a bed for my daughter. And that was like his kind of grief project. It was just a very different way of, 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 of doing, you know, going through that process and doing that stuff together. And I think it's just an example that we just can't, we just can't make assumptions about how people are going to process this stuff. I think just, I think that that, but that point um, it, that's also where tensions come from, isn't it? I think exactly. That, exactly yeah. Why aren't, they, why aren't they more upset? Or why are they crying so much? It was my dad? You know, there's all these kind of the, the, the relational side, and when people are watching each other and going, "Hang on a minute," that's they're behaving at they're behaving in a way that I didn't expect, or I think it's inappropriate, or I think it's this or that, or this or that. It's almost it's also recognizing where your own assumptions come from. And I guess that's that's when you're when you're when you are also bereaved, you're not gonna be able to do that. No. And then again, that's where tensions amplify because people are gonna be very quick to ignite and very quick to make you know, assumptions because they haven't got the bandwidth to be really thinking, hang on a minute, that that's not that's out of that's out of character. Yeah to someone give them the benefit of the doubt it's going to be much more they're doing something wrong you know and and then and maybe not even having the capacity time space to even address that but then to talk to someone else about it and ah, oh, this and so that's what and I think that's where there's, you get a lot of tension when people die some people great if you don't I think lucky harmonious families but for a lot of people there's a lot of relational things that and that's what we don't know we don't have the language to talk about that and, and how to acknowledge that and support one another or even just let it happen and go, okay, you know, families are complicated. We can't yeah. get around this. You can't, you can't suddenly wave a magic wand and it's going, all going to be rosy. Yeah. 
I think I just I just realizing that something I know we're really short on time but Kate when you were saying about harmonious families I think we also just need to kind of float out there that actually you know you know there are some families that that, that, that do navigate this stuff in kind of a fairly easy way and and also you know in terms of funerals and their tensions actually a funeral can be quite restorative you know a funeral can can create some cohesion in the family and I've certainly worked with folks where co-producing the, fa- the funeral together has given them something to focus on and has actually enabled them to get on better <laughs> in a way um so I feel like you know I just wanted to kind of get that out there as well that it's not all it's not all grim you know oh no I've got to arrange a funeral and we're all going to completely fall out like it can actually can actually create some cohesion and and um give you something to look back on that you can go oh yeah we did that together and it was okay uh, one of the papers I put in the chat is is a paper about the co-production of funerals. I'd love to read that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think that you know, from my own personal perspective, that was something that my dad and I crafted very lovingly for mm. my mother. But over the ensuing years, um, my dad and I would would visit the crematorium and take flowers on the anniversary of her death. And after a certain point, I think it was about five years into that, becoming a kind of family tradition. Um, I felt that I, I couldn't really do it anymore. That wasn't how I wanted to remember her or, or kind of that wasn't the relationship I wanted to my, my grief. I remembered her in other ways on her birthday. That's what I wanted to remember her on, you know, a, a, a day that was, was significant to her. Mm. And that was a, a difficult conversation to have with, with my dad because for him, it was absolutely about ritualizing his grief every year in this way. And we, we actually have a, a, um, a question about that, which I think we might just have time for um, uh, from somebody whose mum was the, the glue to their family. And since she died, um, her sister and, and she have continued to do things with um, their dad and family in their mum's honour, even when they may not want to do those things anymore. Um, so the question is, should we continue these traditions when it doesn't feel right anymore? Um, Kate, uh, do, you, do you have something to say about that? I think this is, that's a very, very important question and it's about the negotiation. And I think, Andrew, your example that you just gave, you know, to negotiate, how are you going to do something? It can be very difficult. And it, it won't just happen in the three weeks in the build up to the funeral. It could be, like you said, years later. Um, and I think that's part of the part and parcel of recognizing the long term impact of, of a significant bereavement. It's not just going to take place within this two year time frame that you're going to work through a you know, work through a series of experiences and come to some kind of resolution or at the end it, it, it can be lifelong and and it'll it will evolve so far I'm thinking also there's other times when it might be much more prominent like when you have a child and your parents not there or something you, know, you, 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 you keep coming back to it and and there is an I think it is about evolving and and, for, and and I think for us in the world that we're all in it's also about providing insight and resources that can help people find the language to do that yeah absolutely mm. um Lottie what's your perspective on this um this issue I mean I think very similarly to Kate I just I think these these things can evolve over time and we have to give ourselves permission to let them change adapt um, and, you know, sometimes we have to have really difficult conversations with our families and friends about what feels meaningful and what doesn't and what we're going to do differently. And Kate's absolutely, you know, I really resonate with what Kate was saying about just, you know, when other events in our life come up, that's going to, you know, like a child being born or, you know, a significant event, that's going to change the course of how we want to um, remember those people. Um again so I think it's just I think it's just about being really kind to ourselves and letting things change when they need to and as Kate says I think you know us folks need to kind of keep providing resources and the language and the permission to keep you know keep reimagining and doing these things differently. Thanks yeah I think that that's um, a, a good place to start 
rounding up our discussion. Mm. I know we've only really scratched the surface, as is always the case with these things. And there are a number of other events in the in this Good Grief Mini Festival that hopefully um, audience members who've been here today um, can also attend. Um, and hopefully um, people in the audience who've been able to um, see some of the resources and the, and the links to resources that we've all been sharing. And I think some of you have been sharing them too. Um, hopefully that's been a really good, supportive and safe space um, in, our, in our chat room um, for, for people to discuss their experiences. Um, Kate, Lottie, do we have any final um, words of um, advice or, or, or comfort or roundup um, that we'd like to, um, to give to, to round off this, this, this panel? Um, Kate? <laughs> um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I've, I've admired the Good Grief uh, Fest from afar, so I'm very honoured to have taken part in today. Thank you to everyone for their questions and be kind to yourselves and be kind to one another. I think in talking about relationships, you know, we we need to look after each other. So thank you. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Lottie? Oh, I'll just oh, feel, feel put on the spot, but just want to say, Andrew, Kate, thank you so much. And I just, you know, just thank you to everybody who's here and in the chat. I've just seen some really interesting comments and dialogue that I know we haven't been able to comment on all of it and um, just really valuable discussion so thank you all so much and like Kate said be gentle with each other be kind and remember that um, you know if you do find yourself crafting a funeral it, you can do it in your way you don't have to just be led by what the funeral director tells you no no you know no bad on funeral directors but you can have a ceremony that um, suits you and your family. Thanks so much, Lottie. Thanks so much, Kate. And thank you to everybody um, who's participated um, today. Um, uh, hopefully this, you've really enjoyed this panel and um, that we'll see you again really soon. So take care all, look after yourselves and, and thanks once more. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.